everyone. My name is Mike Lesser, uh, Artistic Director of the Playground Experiment. Yay! Uh, my pronouns are he and his. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge that we are occupying stolen land. And wherever uh, in this country indigenous people live, we honor and respect them. So thank you for being here at the Marjorie S. Dean Little Theater for our second <sighs> Faces of America Roundtable. Uh, for those of you that are uh, new and you're hopefully watching this, uh, last year we decided that we needed to bring companies from around New York City who are doing what they do really well together so they can talk to each other and learn from each other and grow from each other. Uh, so we said last year we brought four amazing companies and we're like, well, let's do it again. So that's pretty much what we're doing tonight. It's a small intimate conversation uh, between brilliant artists in the New York City area who are kind of changing the game of theater, to make theater a little bit more, a li let's, let's not say a little, a lot more <laughs> equitable, diverse, and inclusive. Uh, we have four amazing uh, panelists and an amazing moderator. I will introduce the moderator, and then I will leave. Uh, <laughs> we have the amazing Eric Mead, who is an amazing playwright, actor. <laughs> Applaud for him. Uh, playwright, actor, and uh, all around nice guy. Uh, until we find out how he gives questions. No. Um, and uh, he will be moderating this evening, uh, afternoon. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for watching this. If you're watching this, uh, we hope that this is not just the start of a conversation, but the beginning of a bigger one. Uh, and I give the, the floor to thank all of my panelists and to you, Eric Mead. Thank you, Mike. Uh, as Mike said, my name is Eric Mead. My pronouns are he, him. I'm a first-generation Korean-American mixed-race playwright and actor from New Hampshire who's been living in New York City. Um, and that's really enough about me. I'd like to turn things over to our four amazing panelists. Uh, just to begin with, before we start getting into our discussion topics, I was wondering if we could just go down the line. We'll do this in two rounds. Um, we want to know who you are and, and the organizations that you are working for, but could we start with just uh, your name, your pronouns, and like a little bit of uh, getting to know you kind of stuff. And we can start here and move down stage left. Hi, everybody. I'm Ariel Estrada. He, him, his, Xia uh, are my pronouns. Uh, Xia is a Tagalog word uh, that uh, is a genderless pronoun, um, which I really love that one. And uh, my company is named Leva... No, wait. It's getting to know each other. Yeah, yeah. Just oh, great. Fun uh, fact. Uh, all right. Embarrassing fun fact. Okay. Uh, I still collect comic books, <laughs> and I love them. <laughs> oh, that's... We'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Daniel Mesta. I'm from Latine Musical Theater Lab. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, él. Uh, and yeah, uh, I just actually came to New York City uh, not that long ago. I've been in and out for a while. I moved here from St. Petersburg in Russia, uh, where I actually worked in opera and circus. Uh, and so that's a little bit about me. Hi, everyone. I'm Miranda. Miranda Go. I'm the founder of an organization called Theater Producers of Color. I'm from Providence, Rhode Island, originally. I'm also a commercial producer here in New York City. I guess my fun fact, getting to know you, tidbit of information, I did not grow up as a theater person. I was an ice hockey player for the first part of my life, and then I saw Fun Home at Circle in the Square, and that was the one that brought me in. Uh, my name is Joshua Rose. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And I grew up mostly in Hawaii uh, as a Navy brat. And I am here representing Theater for the People. Cool. Thank you, everybody. Um, now, I'd like you to just tell us a little bit about your organization and your mission. What is it that you all are doing? Uh, my company is Leviathan Lab, where I founded it back in 2009, and I currently serve as the producing artistic director there. We're a uh, creative studio for uh, theater and film for Asian American uh, creative artists. Um, but even within that um, diaspora, uh, I also am very concerned about um, issues of class. Uh, in the way that uh, theater is produced. And we can talk more about that, I guess, when we go to deeper questioning about challenges. And I'll pass it along. Oh, and I, I also s serve on the board of, th of this August organization. So, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, I'm from Latine Musical Theater Lab. We're a newer organization. We're about two years old. 
uh, based here in the city. We represent uh, Latinx playwrights, uh, specifically uh, writers, librettists, composers, uh, who come to us from a variety of places. Some of them are here in the city, some of them are in uh, Latin America and are still working in their countries. Uh, so we're kind of a little bit all over and we're just about kind of, we say radically changing who gets to tell stories, right? On the stages here, on the stages in the US and also stages everywhere. Yeah, theater producers of color uh, stemmed from a personal place. Again, I fell in love with theater when I saw Fun Home on Broadway. Being an ice hockey player, I had no connection to Broadway or the theater world, but something in that show said, I think I want to be a part of bringing important stories uh, to life and connecting them to the rest of the world. And in my mind, uh, that is what I thought a producer did. And after that moment, I said, I think this is what I want to do with my life, but I have no clue what a producer does or how to become one. And uh, really after that moment, I just started pursuing all of the opportunities that were most accessible to me and trying to educate myself. Um, and I found that, you know, luckily I was constantly inspired by the art that I was seeing, uh, but I did learn that this journey to producing was not as easy as I had thought, um, especially as a younger person, a woman, a person of color. And, uh, you know, I started to see who was prioritized when it came to people getting internships or positions in producing offices um, and what, uh, you know, ad advantages certain people had over me. And so, long story short, um, during the pandemic when I think we all had more time and space than we normally would today, um, you know, I thought if I had uh, such passion for theater and wanted to become a producer, I can only imagine that there's an entire community of people who want the same thing or who are at least curious about this but who haven't had the opportunity to do so. So Theater Producers of Color was a response to that instinct um, where in 2020 I started this organization that put together a 10-week course uh, specifically for people from the BIPOC community to learn the ins and outs of commercial producing. Uh, so we welcomed 25 people who were selected from an application pool that first year. Uh, and uh, completed the 10 weeks of education that has now um, evolved into the current iteration of the program we have now where we're in our third year. We have 76 alums. I think we had six people who made their Broadway debuts as producers on Broadway last season who are also Tony nominated now. Um, so, you know, we can talk more about what that it, the actual work in the organization is, but uh, sort of a story of how, uh, you know, that the work that we're doing today is connected to my own personal story. Theater for the People was started in 2010 by Isaac Byrne and Daniel Katrosser. Isaac Byrne is now my uh, co-artistic director. Uh, Daniel has moved across the country and back and, and gone in different routes. Um, but Theater for the People was about taking theater to the people. It started out going to people in Bryant Park and, and doing a show, like a three minute show between the actor and one audience member and that was it. And then the next year they did, they did little snippets of Shakespeare. They would spin a wheel of Shakespeare with an actor and they'd be in Times Square and just like spin a wheel and then they would do that monologue or that scene right there for those people in this in it so that's we started with theater for the people in that sense as we've come through the pandemic and through all of the uh social awakening that's uh, accompanied it coincidentally by time and also with people having time available to them to think about it we've thought about theater for the people as well as not just the audience but also to the artists making theater accessible for people to be theater artists, to be writers, to, to create their plays and get them on stage, to be directors, to be actors, to be designers, anything. Um, and so that's where we're pushing the company now is that, but we're maintaining uh, an accessibility for the audience as well. Uh, all of our shows always have a uh, pay what you can. And even if that's like, here's a penny or here's a scrap of paper that says I owe you a penny. 
um, we always have that available so that theater is accessible uh, as an audience member because that's where you fall in love with it. And then we make it accessible for people to come in and learn how to do the other jobs, um, like learning how to produce or learning how to write and things like that. Uh, so those are the initiatives that we are moving towards. Cool, thank you. So that's, that's our round of introduction. I hope that's the last time we're just going to go down the line in order like this. Um, here on out, I'm going to introduce some discussion topics. And if you uh, want to hop in and, and talk first and be the brave one, please go ahead. And if you're listening and something's firing you up or you, you have some resonance with that and you want to talk about it, please, by all means, jump in. Um, our first question for the four of you that I wrote down is, what does inclusivity in the theater mean to you? And what is it that your organization is doing to promote that? I will, I will start a little bit on that, uh, since I alluded to it a little earlier. So it's, it's not a surprise to any of you that uh, I'm sure that the industry here in New York is very stratified. Right, uh, particularly when it comes not just with actors, it's it's pretty much there's the the triumvirate of Juilliard, Yale, NYU, right? And if you have degrees from those places, if you have had the access to be able to get degrees to those places, right? Uh, even with Juilliard and NYU being free, everybody forgets that 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 is uh, that is re relatively recent, right? Um, you have a leg up. In uh, whether you're a designer, director, playwright, or or actor, uh, if you went to either, all th any three of those schools, you instantly are you literally. I literally had a casting director say once in a workshop, it's just like, look, there are just too, way too many actors. I have to vet, uh, vet them somehow. If you don't have a degree from NYU, Yale, or Juilliard, you just go straight in the circular file. And I'm like, you lazy brat. <laughs> you're, why don't you do your damn job? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, but of course, I didn't tell her that, <laughs> right? And um, you know, and then so even within that, even within the uh, communities of, or the, of theaters of color, um, in, at least in the Asian diaspora, I can't speak for any of the others, but I suspect it's similar. Um, there's a even there. There's the it's it's attached to the Broadway Hollywood machine, right? That supports that kind of stratification, right? Uh, I have another. Uh, there's children in the audience. I have a much less polite word for that Broadway Hollywood machine, the the star effing machine. Um, you can uh, you can infer what that f means, um, which I'm not fond of, right? Because it keeps people like me out. Who I'm a lower middle class kid, immigrant family. I did not go to a Ivy League school. I was the first person to go to college. And I still managed to like come here to New York and eke my way up. But there was always this little ceiling that you would hit that was like covered with NYU, Yale, and Juilliard. So, <laughs> and I would be like, ugh, that's not fair. So that's why I started the company initially. Um, and it grew to actively like saying, look, it, there's plenty of chances if you've got, it's not that I haven't worked with those, with those folks with my company, but if they ha I literally do the opposite. If you have NYU, Juilliard, or Yale on your <laughs> resume, I go, there's other chances for you in this city. Um, and I actively, collectively do that. Uh, and so that, that's what I mean by working against class right there. And, um, you know, and because there's some of the best artists I've ever met did not have Pe that, that pedigree, right? And yet they're not given the chance to get their 10,000 hours towards proficiency, right? That our white colleagues definitely do, uh, get. And then even if you are, uh, aren't white <laughs> and you got work come into these systems that promote this in inequity, it's still just going to keep promoting inequity, right? For the people who have the access and privilege. So. That's my Kami Pinko rant. Uh, I'll pass it along to somebody else that they can either rant either uh, on their own other uh, own priorities. I'll rant. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, wh when it comes to to equity and inclusion in this business, honestly, you hear an awful lot of pledges, and and most of it is a joke. Uh, uh, kind of a cruel joke and kind of an inside joke, right? There's a lot of ways to keep especially communities of color, but certainly not only communities of color, out of the mainstream. Uh, but when, when I talk about inclusivity in, in our organization, you know, I, I want to take the conversation a little bit of a different direction. 
uh, which is the freedom not only to participate in the theater machine, but also the freedom to tell your stories, whatever your stories look like. There's an awful lot of chatter sometimes in theater communities, especially writing communities, uh, you know, where you hear a lot about representation and storytelling, who gets to tell which stories and why, but also who needs to be in, in whichever stories and, and, and why, and moderating and, and policing the idea uh, of that, which has a lot of merit and comes from a place that I think is really necessary. Uh, I think that those discussions, as painful as they can be, especially in a culturally specific organization that still has so much depth of participants and, and identities represented within it. Yes, it can be challenging, but at the end of the day, it's not, uh, I believe it's not necessarily writers' jobs uh, to tell any story besides the one that feels natural to them. And that, uh, and that feels that it speaks to their creative impulses and their ideas. And a question I get a lot from writers, emails that I see a lot are things like, am I Latin enough for your organization because I don't speak Spanish? Or because I wrote you know, an adaptation of a Shakespeare play? Or you know, because uh, the play isn't uh, bilingual, it's actually like set in Italy, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, so, and, and, and it's overcoming that, and overcoming, you know, to the point where you say, these conversations have merit, and although to some of us who have them quite often, they may seem quite old, to the industry at large, they're actually not happening enough. Uh, but when it, it trickles down to writers, and, and especially Latinx writers, you know, which, which is what I'm most familiar with, I do hear this notion a lot of, is it enough, am I enough? Uh, you know, am I representing enough people? And what, you know, I always say is anything that you do is a part of our culture. Anything that you do represents you, right? And therefore it is enough for us. And you're not the people who need to be policing yourselves in terms of what you're representing, what you're writing about, what you're looking at. That is a big picture job. That's an organization issue and that's an industry issue. So for us, that's what inclusion looks like, is being able to empower creatives to tell the stories that matter to them as, as wildly and adventurously as possible, and then also turning then to the bigger folks that sometimes we look up to, sometimes we look to the side to, and that always we rail at, uh, <laughs> right? And being able to say, okay, now that we have this pipeline of stories, this is on you to deal with this. Thank you. I'll continue down the line. Um, I think inclusivity is, is all about accessibility within theater producers of color. I think, again, it's really hard for anyone to really truly know what a producer does. There aren't many resources uh, that teach people what producing is that are accessible. Um, you know, one story I always point to is that when I did first start out in this business in New York City, I was working at Manhattan Theater Club as a producing fellow, and uh, that's a nonprofit theater, which is a slightly different producing model. And, um, you know, while I enjoyed my time there and learned a lot, I still had my eyes on Broadway. And the one training program that did exist um, that's on hiatus right now is called Commercial Theater Institute, which is sort of like a training ground for Broadway producers. Um, but to get accepted into that program, you had to have a letter of recommendation from a Broadway League member, which is the trade organization for Broadway producers. Um, so one, you had to know the right people. You also had to pay uh, tuition, which I think then was $1,000. And when I was you know, a producing fellow at, at MTC, uh, the payment that I did receive, while admittedly better than most programs at that time, uh, was not uh, putting me in a position to be able to, you know, pay a thousand dollars on top of rent and food, uh, and you know, buying a rush ticket to a show at Playwrights Horizons. Um, so all of that to say, you know, I was, I, I think I was in a good position, a, a very privileged position to be able to take advantage of that opportunity, um, and I, I, I was able to do it, uh, but. Again, thinking about you know how do we want to make our industry better? To me, 
it, the change really has to stem from the top down. And to me, the top is the producer. They have to paint the picture for, uh, you know, how they want a production to come to life and in which way. Um, so it was really important to me when starting theater producers of color that all of the barriers to entry that I had observed were eliminated so that, you know, anyone who applied could, um, you know, feel like they were supported. So it's a tuition-free program. You uh, fill out a very short application. That's three questions. Submit your resume, and there are two rounds of uh, review process for those applications. Um, and so I think that's what inclusivity to theater producers of color, which we also call TPOC, is. Um, and the other thing I'll just say, in general, uh, being in this industry, I think inclusivity is also about um, setting people up for success, uh, no matter whether they're a producer or a writer or an actor. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now is a musical called How to Dance in Ohio on Broadway. Um, and uh, one of our lead producers is also a program mentor in TPOC, so Sammy Lopez puts together our curriculum every year. He says, I think these are the nuts and bolts of commercial producing that people should learn. These are the people who should introduce the material um, and you know, just hearing how he's approached the process of putting How to Dance in Ohio um, up on its feet has been really inspiring. S things as simple as sending out a Google form to the company before rehearsals start, asking, you know, what what do you need to be best set up for success? What are your accessibility needs? And really creating an environment where people feel uh, comfortable to share all of that with each other. Um, so I think it's it's also about asking ourselves, like, what do we need as human beings to do our jobs well? Um, because you know you can create the access, but you have to also make sure that people um, can do what they need to do. Uh, inclusivity as the uh, cis white male on this panel uh, for theater for the people for Isaac and I we sit and have conversations all the time about um, what we want the company to be and what we want it to say and one of the things that we struck on is that we did not feel like we were the people to be the gatekeepers we didn't feel comfortable saying that these are the artists and these are the people who are allowed access to the resources we make available. So we've largely given that up. We partner with theater companies in New York City in the area. Um, uh, Naked Angels, Latinx Playwrights, uh, Playwright Lab, I'm thinking, I'm forgetting a couple of others. And we have them nominate people to like artists that they work with and then to come take advantage of our at the barn residency. Um, we also then, the people who come and stay at the barn, they get to nominate people. The first year, you would not believe how hard it was to give away a week in the country and $225. We were, we were reaching out to people, hey, we want to give you a week in the country and we want to give you this money and they're like, no. <laughs> you don't want money? I'm afraid of it. Yeah. So it just like people thought that there were going to be all these strings. So we talked to a lot of people about uh, residencies and these retreats and, and, and what, were the, what were the complications, what were the hurdles. Um, and what we determined is that there's nothing due. For us, there's nothing due at the end of your week. You don't need to write out a paper that's like six pages long about what you did. You don't have to turn in a, a finished script. Because sometimes what you need is to start every day on a page and at the end of the day realize, no, no, that's not what's, no, this is not. Mm -mm. And throw that away, and then the next day, start with a page and go, okay, maybe. And then the next day, you read it, and you go, no, no, that. And you might do that for the entire week, but that's still part of the process. And, and so we didn't want people to feel like they needed that pressure. And that's, that's part of the whole point of, of the At the Barn initiative, is giving people an escape from the pressure and the energy of New York City, getting to where it's peaceful and calm and you can see the stars at night 
and there's no pressure. And you can work at your own pace, and, and nobody's expecting anything at the end of the week. The only thing we expect is like a 30 second video of like, this is what I did with my time, I enjoyed it, okay, that's it, bye. <laughs> and we found that once people knew that there weren't all these strings attached to it, uh, we've, we've, it's, we found it easier to give money away. Not guaranteed though, we still end up with one month every year that ends up falling apart and not happening. But inclusivity is getting voices that don't sound like mine. Because I've been raised up, as most people in theater have, on Shakespeare and Mamet and Kushner and um, Beckett. And, and I've heard all of that. I've heard all of those voices. And they're all white male voices. And I've always found the, one, the voices that aren't that to be more interesting to me as a designer working on a show. Um, I'm also really excited about new work. Um, I, I do a lot of old work as a designer because that's what pays the bills. But what, what really gets me excited is being in a room with a writer and the writer's like, well, I, I want this dragon to erupt out of the stage and, and burn everything down. But you can't do that. So I, I'm going to make it a mouse. And I'm like, no, no, no. Keep it as a dragon. Give me the impossible thing. That's what, theaters, that's what theater magic is all about. Give me the impossible thing. And I'll talk about how we might be able to do it. And then you can adapt it. And the director can go, oh, but then I can do this. And the costume designer's like, hey, we can do these costumes that turn inside out. And suddenly they're all on, on fire with the, with the costume turning in and out, uh, inside out. And that collaboration where, and so just that inclusivity, having as many different voices and different experiences and different worldviews in the room makes better art in a collaborative form. Otherwise, I'm just in an echo chamber. Okay, I want to I wanna respond to that, actually. I think that's something that I see as a barrier for a lot of theater writers of color when you're talking about artists who censor themselves already in their scripts. You know, and, and that's something I'm always telling writers. Um, I work as the lab's literary manager and resident dramaturg, by the way. I don't know if I made that clear. Now you know. Um, so so it's, it's a lot of really hands-on, you know, stuff with writers. And I hear this all the time, which is they're not going to be able to stage this. No one is going to do this. This kind of self-censorship because there is ultimately this push when you're in a community that has so many barriers uh, already that you are perceiving in front of you, the idea that like, but if I can maybe make it really commercial, or if I can make it, you know, really easy on designers, or if I can make it cheaper, or if I can make it smaller cast, or, you know, um, and, and, and so that's a barrier I see an awful lot, especially for these writers. And, and it's kind of funny because I think like, okay, but if you were like, like a mediocre white playwright, like white, write with that kind of boldness. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, and that just sort of expectation that, um, you know, and, and, and entitlement that, that uh, you know, that, that that could just happen, that that could just be the possibility. Let that be a producer's job. Let that be an admin's job. Let that be somebody else's job to put restraints on you. Don't put them on yourself when you are writing. Um, but it is, it's a barrier I see all the time, especially with the writers that I work with. Absolutely. Um, so when we're talking about inclusivity, I think that's so fascinating because that is an element I had never thought of before. But it's true, writing without those restraints is truly including sometimes yourself into, into that mix. I love that. And now I want to see your dragon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just going to add to that by saying, look, there's so much of, of the barriers that are created are created because they're, we're instantly going for product as opposed to like doing, uh, really sort of giving the people who traditionally do not have access um, the inability to be able to, to explore process, right? Uh, too often, um, you know, and we've, many of us here are from marginalized communities, right? And we have, you know, we're expected to come whole cloth out of the head of Zeus. Uh, and right, and uh, work, t and then once you come out whole cloth from the head of Zeus, you work um, tend to have to work 
10 times, 20 times harder than your white colleagues. And, and God forbid if you're a woman of color in the industry, because then you have to work 100 times harder <laughs> to, to, be, to even get half the access that a mediocre white man. Um, I didn't mean to. But <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, I think that the, the pattern that I'm seeing from like the, all four of our work is like, how can we move that? How do we dismantle the barriers for people? And what, what are those barriers? We're all attacking it from various, uh, various ways, whether it's me being Kami, Kami Pinko going from class, or, or people doing artistically purely, you know, or from um, taking nonprofit models and applying them to, uh, and models of equity and moving it to um, the commercial world, which is famously not as equitable. <laughs> Even, or, um, you know, there's a lot of dismantling going on and rebuilding, which I think is very cool. Speaking of mediocre white men um, reaching for the stars, <laughs> Shakespeare in the 16th century starts two, at least two of his plays with a shipwreck. Popular so, theme. <laughs> I'm just saying, if he could do that with their technology then, why do you think anything that you are imagining is impossible with our technology now? Cool, cool fun fact about, uh, I'm sorry, this is going to be part of the conversation thing. So the zeitgeist around that time, you know how Shakespeare is like, oh, every, like he's the first writer to start like moving into actual character work and everything. Well, it's actually kind of bullpucky because um, it seemed like it was just in the zeitgeist of world theater at that time, right, where all of the writers, and somehow, and of course they were communicating with each other across ships and stuff, but, um, but the writers at that time, and it took about 60 years to sort of like permeate worldwide, but all the writers started working on, on moving beyond um, just a, a, of a moving, be, like starting to work really deeply on character work. Right, and getting into moving into what we now now see in movies now, but and um, anyway, I just think that's if in terms of inclusivity, I love thinking about world theater, about moving like who are the if we Shakespeare gets done so often and like there's a whole literally a whole world of playwrights at that same amount of same time that we could draw from. Thank you. I'd like to uh, move on to this next question, bringing things back to your organizations. Um, what has been the greatest challenge of growing your organization? And what strategies have you, you know, had to develop to, to work through those or, or learn from those? Money, next question. <laughs> <laughs> it's not much more complicated than that. Money. It's, uh, it, it's the answer. I will just say, you know, theater producers of color, along with many other amazing organizations uh, that are social justice oriented, were started during the pandemic when people, again, had all this time and space on their hands. Um, I have another organization called the Industry Standard Group, uh, which Ariel is a part of, uh, which similarly aims to create access to underrepresented, underrepresented communities uh, to Broadway investing and producing. I started that with seven other BIPOC producers. And so now we have you know, this, these amazing organizations that we're running, but not only are we, are we running them, uh, we're, you know, Rashad Chambers, who's one of our co-founders, produced Fat Ham on Broadway last year. Sammy's doing How to Dance in Ohio and is in workshops for Gun and Powder, which is going to New Jersey in the spring. So it's, I think it's capacity uh, building where not only are we um, doing what we've always wanted to do, which is produce new work um, and introducing it to the world, but also uh, leading with our, our, our values and trying to uh, make an impact on the larger industry. Um, so I think it's capacity building and um, money, the easy answer. And, and in terms of that money, like having um, either allies who are, um, who get it about providing access for people or having more people who look like us up there in the um, in in the leadership positions, right? And it's oh, and it's really hard to be in those leadership positions because again, have to work ten times, hundred times as hard, right? And you aren't always going to have a lot of allies 
in those situations, right? I have heard, I have been through one myself personally, but working for um, for these organizations that have traditionally been led by straight white men, right? Or not straight white men too, but um, but cis white men. There we go. Uh, who you know? Who have an agenda to not to make sure that you that not too much change happens, so that they don't have to give up their power, but that there is an appearance of giving some some of their power, right? And rather than actual change, right? And that's always rough, right? But the more we of uh, uh, we get people who look like us up there, the easier it's going to be to get that money, <laughs> I think. And you know, the more we're going to start leading with our values, and we won't have to, we, we can start not, maybe we can start working five times as hard or even three times as hard rather than 10 times as, as hard, right? And, you know, and in terms of the money, at least with Leviathan, I mean, and this is, this is, a, it'd be a slightly weird thing to say because of course the capitalist goal would be like, well, of course we're eventually gonna go to an off-Broadway contract and maybe we'll finally sell something that goes to Broadway. And that's awesome. That's great that people do that because people should eat, right? But then I'm always, I'm, again, I'm really concerned about helping those folks that, were, again, were, came from immigrant families and did not, do not have generational wealth. And I will probably never have generational wealth or, you know, or have too many rich friends because in order to have rich friends, you have to be kind of rich yourself sometimes, right? So, or most of the time, right? And I'm, always, I'm much more concerned about those folks being able to create art and succeed as artists. So that means working under showcase code. Uh, many of you probably work on those on um, showcase code or even 29 hour reading uh, agreements, right? There's only so much that I want to bring the company up because we are a development company. I will probably never go up above 150 or even $200,000 in my organization. And that's enough for the work that I'm doing, right? And I also recognize that my company is transitory. One day, somebody will probably come up with a better idea than me, and I'll be glad to give up those reins and maybe go be an actor myself at some point. Anyway, that was a long uh, tirade about how um, sometimes the barriers are so intense, the best I can do is sort of work within those barriers and try to rabble rouse within that, I guess is the best way to describe it. One of the things that money gives you is the ability to let go of ev other things. Um, when, when you're, like Isaac and I are both working professionals, running a company. I have in the last 12 months designed, worked on 19 shows. Some of them were two day gigs which means that it was a one-day gig, but I worked on it for two days because, you know, you got to do your prep work. Uh, some of them I worked on for months. And it's all overlapping, but along with all of that, running this organization as well. And so there were times that Isaac would hand things over to me because he was too busy, and things, times that I would hand things back to him because I was too busy. But when your, your organization has funding, you can go, my job is to be the artistic director of this company. And so I'm going to work, I'm only gonna do nine shows in 12 months. And the rest of the time I'm going to block out and say I'm doing this for this time. And this is one of the things we're moving towards is, is getting money so that we can hire some of our, our cooperative and say, okay, you get to be the producer on this show. Here's the, here's, here's the fee for the producer. Now you don't have to wait tables as many nights. So you can do this thing instead and become, learn how to be a producer better. And, and also take that producer role off of my plate so that I can focus on being the designer for the show. Um, so that it's one of those things that people, you think that it's money, but money, time is money, money is time. Money can buy you time by, by taking things off your plate. I wanted to sort of follow up with this question with um, 
maybe maybe this is uh, more challenging, but um, you know, with any enterprise, with any mission, with any growth of a company, you, you're inevitably going to run up against uh, failure. Um, but it's always a good learning opportunity. I was curious if any of you wanted to share a sort of moment in the growth of your organization or company where you sort of hit something and you were like, oh, I, I, I might have messed this up. And then it, it sort of gave you a lesson to, to move forward in a different way. And if the answer is no, you're all perfect. That's okay, too. Um, <laughs> our company recently did a production of Aaron Posner's uh, stupid effing bird. Just a child in the front row. Um, this is New York City. Um, she's heard it. Um, we were just supposed to be the co-producers. We were just coming in to help, you know, with the venue and the casting and, and providing some kind of production support. Somebody else was supposed to produce it. Two other people, in fact. We were just coming in to help. And then those two other people fell away and we were left with this show that was on the books, we paid for the rights, we had the space, and we had to make the show happen or not. I think we ended up um, with a very good show, which the audiences all seemed to love, but we were completely burnt out by the end of it. So uh, the mistake we made was not making sure we had a letter of agreement with those people to make sure that we knew, everybody knew what exactly what we were going to do. What's the fastest way to lose friends? Don't have a contract. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> yeah. No, but like that's what I, I wanted to talk about a little bit as well. Though I, you know, the, I I make mistakes like every single day, um, of that I go to work, um, which is all the days. <laughs> and um, uh, yes, so for any of you, especially writers, um, dramaturgs actually aren't perfect. It's just a trained <laughs> illusion that you are sold over and over again. Uh, no, I really, I remember being in school and going to one of my first dramaturgy classes and my professor was like, all right, so your job is to be perfect. And I was like, great. Uh, not a real thing. Um, uh, I, earlier this year, and I'm going to plead the fifth on some of the details, um, but, you know, what I have learned from making some just miscalculations that seem kind of small but can actually be quite colossal is that your organization is only as powerful uh, as your friends, um, as the friends that your organization has. Um, r really, when it comes down to it, and you know, you're, you're, I mean, in general, in any role in the theater, right, your ability to succeed starts and ends with your ability to work as a team. Um, and the same is true organizationally, we've found. Um, I'm talking, it's actually not for this current organization, and the example I'm thinking of is for a different organization I'm also a part of, but uh, you know, when, when it comes down to it, especially during COVID, I think we all learned that it maybe doesn't matter how well we're doing, all of us are just a few bad months away from total disaster. Um, and yeah, being able to network, being able to have friends, being able to have other organizations who can step in and support you is the only way, you know, we talk sometimes about, uh, you know, this is a tough business and it's sink or swim, but like the, the scarcity and the competition sometimes, especially in a time of crisis for your organization is for me has, has shown me that that is a completely constructed idea. Um, when we work together, we are infinitely stronger, we're infinitely better, and on our worst days, there are other orgs out there that will help us. And they tend to be culturally specific organizations, uh, I've learned, and I don't know exactly why that is, although I have theories. Um, but yeah, you know, when we're, we're all in our, our little pods, but also a lot of us, even just with our conversation today, we're kind of in the same boat. Um, and being able to be there for each other is kind of the only way forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, 
before I go into my uh, my embarrassing, horrible story that you're all going to learn from, so you don't do it <laughs> yourselves, <laughs> uh, I think just sort of ways forward, just um, carrying up on that. It's like I'm also involved. In, like Miranda said, I work with with um, uh, industry standards group, and I work with um, uh, with Latina Theater Lab, Musical Theater Lab, and I think I'm starting to see much more of that uh, in that people are. And, or and if not, I'm going to try to spearhead it uh, or lead that. I can't, we can't use spearhead anymore. That's a terrible term. Um, yeah, uh, is to uh, is to start working cross organizationally and in support of other uh, of organizations that aren't just your cultural specificity, right? Um, I also do a lot of work with with um, LGBTQIA plus groups, particularly with trans kids, right? And with the lab and with making it, yes, it's a lot more work, um, but we're at that point, I think, um, where we need to, you know, still take care of ourselves, but we, in some ways, we, there's, we're being called to, to work together more and like not silo as much because if anything, the last couple of years um, under a certain orange person um, have learned, right, it, we get, when we, uh, uh, it can be used against us, our work to, um, to make safe, create safe and uh, spaces for our communities, right? But it can also be used against us, right? The goal is to always sort of like go out and build bridges and work with each other and, and work in solidarity so that we can work against the, uh, what they've discovered is our, is our Achilles heel, right? Um, anyway, uh, my horrible warning story uh, is to believe in yourself <laughs> and have uh, have confidence in your own mission and um, and and how you're going to accomplish that mission. Because in the early days of Leviathan, I had a board. I, I thought, oh well, I guess the the trajectory is to uh, to be start producing off Broadway shows and eventually try to sell something to Broadway. Again, perfectly valid path, right? Um, and they were. I was always uncomfortable with that path, and I didn't know why. Because I was, to be fair, I wasn't um, wasn't comfortable enough in my power at that point, uh, and my abilities, uh, or even knowledge of the mission itself, uh, to know that it wasn't right. I just didn't know it wasn't right, right. And eventually, I, I had gathered this board and staff around me that was really trying to uh, change the company into a comer basically a commercial venture, or um, and I was like, this is not serving the mission that I want to serve. What is happening? And it even got to the point where they tried to oust me out of the own, my own company that I founded. Um, luckily, uh, I had a board member who was on my side and also who worked in, uh, in tech. <laughs> worked in tech, so she was well-versed with hostile takeovers. Yeah. And, she, and she pointed out to me that, like, you are being hostily taken over right now. You need to fight. And I did. And in that uh, process, I lost um, pretty much all my board and my staff, either through uh, firing or quitting, <laughs> right? And I was like, okay, do I keep going? <laughs> and I go, do is this tend to throw in the towel? And I breathed, took a couple months to think about it, and I realized, oh, I can do this. And I rebuilt my board with people who are like-minded and believed in my mission. Right, and you have to find people who believe in it, right? And now I have this fantastic board who really supports what I'm doing. Um, and through blood, sweat, and tears, I sort of came into my own leadership abilities in that, right? Because I didn't believe in myself as a leader, and then I did. But it took sort of going through that, through people not believing in me, <laughs> and uh, like, you know, trying to literally oust me out of my own company to do it. Hopefully that won't happen to you now that you know this embarrassing story. <laughs> All right, well, we're coming up towards the end of our time, so I wanted to give a chance for any members of the audience to ask our panelists any questions that they would like. And we can pass the mic around. Mike can pass the mic around? Somebody's going to pass the mic around. I can do it. <laughs> Uh, 
My question came, I think, Ariel, is that yes. your name? That's and me. you mentioned the showcase code, which made me wonder if Actors' Equity Association and any other unions are helpful to you in your missions at this point or not, or what the unions can do to help you in your missions. I mean, I'm a member of Equity and SAG and all those things, so I'm curious about that. Making sure there's no drones around. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, ironically, I was on staff at Equity for the three for three years. I was the uh, diversity and um, on of the two member diversity and inclusion team um, for 54,000 members. <sighs> wow, that was intense. All right, <laughs> and um, as diplomatically as possible, I'm going to say that uh, that go union, right, and that they uh, they do protect. Um, they, they are there for the protection of its members. I will also say that, and I'll just leave, leave it at this, that 1% of the income that, equi that equity takes in, sorry, 99% of the income that equity takes in um, comes from 1% of the members who actually work on Broadway and regionally, but mostly Broadway and off-Broadway. Who do you, th in that scenario, there's a very certain group of people who that union is probably going to be working for, <laughs> right? And um, it probably isn't for the people who aren't making them that much money. With that in mind, um, for, us, for me, I'm gonna put on my producer hat for a second. Um, it, I'll just tell a quick story about how, um, remember the 99 seat LA deal? Thing and it got uh, they people the members were so mad and those members were the ones who don't usually typically work on an equity contract um, but pay their dues uh, they you know they threatened to secede they started to threaten to create their own union because equity was really coming down hard on it um, on on um, LA producers and it had such a bad reaction that they decided to not pursue that here, at least in the same way, to get rid of the showcase code here. I mean, that's sort of insider baseball, but they, 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 it's, it's hard to be, I'm realizing this is on camera, so I'm trying to be very, there's the drone. Um, so I'm trying to be um, political about it. Um, I get that it's to protect, protect certain people, but I wonder if it does, it is in some ways an art killer. Right, and it certainly makes our jobs as producer, they don't make it easy. Like basic things like not keeping up with technology and or with how tape is essential for a nonprofit organization like mine, where it's sort of like I get these, the, you know, these funders wanna see proof of what we've done more than just pictures and a program. And if I can't record without spending literally um, $10,000 to get a recording of a showcase <laughs> that, uh, so it's hard for me to get grants, right? And I have to, yeah, and it's, it's difficult. I mean, there's ways that you can work with, work and do that, but it's tough. Anyway, that's my answer to that, my hopefully political answer to that. <laughs> uh, everything he just said. And I'm also a member of IATSE USA, so I'm pro-union. Um, and I look at the code and I understand when the code was written and what protections it provides, um, but it is an absolute art killer. And, and we, it needs to be looked at and, and evaluated annually to make sure that this still serves the people it's supposed to serve, because the showcase code is supposed to help actors get seen so that they can get parts and move on and become that Broadway star. Um, playwrights too, I mean. And playwrights, it, yeah. so that and plays directors. and directors can be seen, so their work can be seen, but, but equity doesn't care about the playwrights or the directors. They're only, care, they're only interested in the actors. And so they they aren't worried about doing the best version of that show. 
which has different requirements depending on the show. So I, th I think that, yeah, those, it's always good to have a framework and limitations are good. Just look at Julie Taymor's work. Um, when she has limitations, she does amazing things. And when they say, do whatever you want, you get Spider-Man on Turn Off the Dark. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, will, I, I will never work with Julie Taymor now. Because um, <clears throat> I said that out loud. Um, but yeah, that's... Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, thank you all so much. I'm a playwright and I'm a parent. And I wonder, um, I'm also the parent of a medically complex kiddo, and I wonder when you think about inclusion if you consider the cost of childcare. And I say this specifically around, um, although it's not just moms, but a lot of women who are um, raising children end up being sort of left on the other side of theater. Uh, for myself, I know trying to create my own work and paying for a babysitter was not a possibility. And I just want to sort of, you know, there's a lot of different kinds of caregivers out there. People are now, you know, they take care of their parents. They are taking care of their partners. So it's just another aspect of inclusivity that I'm curious if your organizations are considering. With our At The Barn initiative, uh, children, pets, and partners are welcome to accompany the artist to the barn. Um, we do think about limitations such as child care. Uh, we don't have any resources to throw at it, but it is something that we are, it, it is on our radar. Um, yeah. I think within TPOC, it's part of the education of uh, producers, what environments we want to welcome our companies into, and again, how we can best support our, our various team members. One of my first jobs in New York City was with a, an organization called the Playwrights Realm. It's an off-Broadway producing organization, and one of the people who I consider a mentor uh, is Roberta Pereira, who, as you're nodding, so I'm sure you know who I'm talking about, but I look to her as someone uh, who, you know, has a daughter of her own and um, has consciously been thinking about, you know, how she can uh, set mothers specifically up for success within, um, you know, the model that we make work and so you know even from inviting when we invite people to readings acknowledging that oh you might only be able to go to this if you hire a babysitter so thinking about oh what if we offer you like a reimbursement for your babysitter or um, you know how can we create a rehearsal schedule that is setting you up for success and uh, has rooms available uh, for, for lactation, things like that. So I think, again, it, it's the people who've actually been through the experience themselves who are like, oh, I would like to change this for other people who might face similar problems. Um, and, you know, that's sort of like, I feel like what we've all been doing in, in these past few years. Um, so I think that's a great question. Thanks. I'm a huge fan of PAL, a parent, it's, it's, yeah, 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 wonderful organization. And that, um, you know, it, typically, I, if the, the director, and it's usually the director, um, has needs childcare, I usually just um, automatically negotiate that as part of their agreement, right? Cause just providing it, because it's just, it's hard enough being a parent in New York City, um, right? But again, you know, it's it's similar too with uh, things that we're doing with um, with trying to provide, uh, like for example, there's no way that I could possibly afford uh, a um, sign language interpreter for every performance because we just don't have that um, have those resources. But we do do what we can within the budget that we've got, right? And same thing with anything with childcare. Um, you know, because we don't with the inclusivity we want to keep. Get, I mean, inclusivity means that everyone. Um, I'm going to pull up my, doc, my geek Doctor Who thing. But everyone lives. Everyone makes it, right? <laughs> no, one, no one doesn't make it, right? Um, you know, and of course, uh, of course, under capitalist systems, uh, only the strong survive, uh, supposedly. So <laughs> uh, I like to debunk all of that, so, yeah. I, 
I have a question, and it's hello. Um, it's primarily for Miranda because I took the TPOC, um, we, uh, the the TPOC workshop, and I highly recommend it, even if you uh, don't end up being a Tony-nominated Broadway producer. Um, <laughs> I'm so proud of my classmates, though I have to say. Um, so I, I so I'm familiar with the orders of magnitude in the budgets for Broadway shows, and I'm familiar with, um, and, and I have heard that there were some agreements between Playwrights Horizons and other uh, entities to, um, to have right of first refusal on, on whatever play came out of there for a certain uh, gigantic um, donation. What positive models do you see in the um, the enhancement money or the uh, nonprofit partnering with commercial theater models that seem to be popping up with the very large nonprofit theaters that might be uh, useful for us smaller theaters to start thinking about and approaching slightly larger theaters in, in the spirit of creating the friendships and relationships that the other panelists have spoken about. Yeah, I think nonprofit theaters and commercial producers will continue working together and are probably more necessary to each other more than ever. Um, it's a sharing of resources. Uh, nonprofits provide things that uh, commercial producers have to outsource. So, you know, MTC has a marketing department, a casting department, uh, a press team. All of that in the commercial theater is outsourced and hired. Uh, by third parties, so I think naturally there's uh, this this sharing of resources that's really beneficial. Um, you know, nonprofits are in a moment of a lot of transition and change, where uh, subscriptions are down, and they're having to cultivate audiences that uh, you know weren't targeted before the pandemic. So. Uh, by nature of how expensive theater is becoming, I think collaborations with commercial producers are getting more attractive because usually that means that commercial producers are trying to help finance uh, a specific project and making it possible. So it's it's I think it's it's a great thing. I think it will continue happening. Um, yeah. One more question. Here. Hi. Um, I'm Evan Edwards, actor, director, playwright, teacher. My question is, what advice would you give to someone who wanted to start an inclusive type of group or theater company? <laughs> I have one. Uh, start with your mission and stick to your mission. Uh, it is so easy at a new organization, I think about my organization that I'm representing today, which is quite new. It is so easy to be served such a, uh, I don't know, there's, there's, there's a really fascinating menu of options, uh, especially in New York City, where you could take your organization. Um, but letting your mission dictate what you do next, what you do today, is more important than letting your organization, letting your employees, letting your ego, letting your cash flow, all of those things uh, that are huge, huge factors in running an organization, but your mission has to be in control. And in order to have that control that you're gonna want later, because you know, if, if you're sliding around, right, if you stand for, what is it, nothing? I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, you know, but having, having that mission and that bedrock and then getting the discipline to stick to it is the thing that can keep you going in, uh, you know, because a lot of new organizations that wash out, it's because of some significant mission drift. Um, you didn't form a concrete context around which people can perceive, attend, involve themselves, donate to. Uh, and, and so you kind of burn up. So for me, I would say mission first, everything else second. Um, hi, uh, I'm Scott Sickles. I am a, a former uh, off-off-Broadway producer, and everything I've heard you say tonight or today really 
does not make me miss producing. And one of so the playwrights. Thank you for all of your work. Oh my God. He's also one of the playwrights that Leviathan is supporting. Yeah, yes, th yes, I am, and I'm very, very pleased. And as a playwright, I am, um, uh, I am uh, a LGBTQ playwright. I am uh, a, a BIPOC API playwright, um, and I'm a neurodivergent playwright. So I have the alphabet covered. And um, and so for um, people in these different groups, for playwrights in these different groups, um, you know. I mean, I just, I noticed that the most produced playwright, the lists of the most produced playwrights and the most produced shows every year tend to, um, a lot of the same titles and a lot of the same names are circulated and circulated year after year. And it's great for the people who have a track record and they've earned that track record. For those of us who don't and, are, and have important and urgent messages to get out from these individual or combined perspectives, um, where do we go, what do we do? Yeah, I went to Ariel. <laughs> <laughs> Go to Ariel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For as long as I can last. Um, the uh, I'm just going to answer that you're doing uh, you're doing the right thing. <laughs> uh, no, but no, seriously. There's a you know we can't depend on those uh, on all those um, pa traditional pathways to do of doing things, right? It's part. It's certainly why. I'm, um, Latina Theater Lab works and why I work with them, right? And we're all sort of like forging our own paths here because, again, the gateways are so intense and the people who are trying to protect those gateways are so intense um, that in some ways the only thing, only option, to my mind, uh, at any rate, is, um, is to forge your own path. But I, it may not be, I recognize it's a very privileged statement, however, Right, and that, you know, maybe it's hard to pursue that path even if you don't have levels of access to even reach someone like me, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's a good answer. As a playwright, submit. Submit to everybody. Submit to every company. Sub look, find the list of all the companies. Find their literary agent, literary director. Get in touch with them. Say, how do I submit to you? Submit to everyone. Just get it out there and then take all of the no's and total them up and be like, you know, as soon as I get a thousand no's, I've won. <laughs> because if, if, you, if you celebrate each and every no, you, you're gonna, you gotta get all the no's to get the yes. So you gotta just let go of, of rejection. Just, it's gotta, it's gotta, you gotta celebrate it. Be like, yes, I got another no. Whew, that means somebody's read it. And then they may, when they read your next thing, and your next thing is a little bit better, or more in the ve avenue of what they're thinking, they're like, oh, I remember this guy. Oh, this is a lot better. I like this. I'm, okay. And then they'll start to reach out to you. You just gotta keep going. Just submit to everybody. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here. And please give it up for our amazing panelists. And I will hand the microphone back to Mike and bid you all adieu. Give it for Eric Mead and this amazing group of panelists. Uh, we hope that this is just the beginning and the start of a conversation, and hopefully a start of conversations between each of you together. Uh, everybody knows Ariel, so we're fine. <laughs> uh, uh, little full disclosure, Ariel and I go back even before the Playground Experiment, when I was starting the Playground Experiment, I reached out to Ariel and I'm like, can we have a conversation? And we sat at a coffee shop. That's, which is still around, I think. I think so? Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, how do I start something? And he, the Playground Experiment is because of people like Ariel. So, you know, <laughs> conversations between companies, this is how it begins. Thank you if you're watching this. If you're watching this and you loved it, like the video. Send us stuff. Also, watch last year's video. We have amazing company from last year. Uh, give our thank you for all of our wonderful attendees today. Uh, this is part of our uh, festival, uh, Faces of America Monologue Festival week, at, week day, I get day. Um, this is our fifth festival tonight. We have some amazing performances and uh, perf uh, thank you. You can stop the video because give it up again one more time. <laughs> <laughs>